Hello everyone and welcome back to Kobean History. In today's siege tactic video we will have a look at medieval special operations. Like today's special forces, these operations would be covert missions in hostile territory, usually with high stakes. If they were discovered, a whole group of soldiers could be wiped out, but if they succeeded, the reward could be huge. In a single night, a group of a few dozen people could achieve something that might otherwise take a whole army months to achieve. Specific special forces units, like the SAS or the Navy SEALs, did not exist in the Middle Ages. But special operations like this were an integral part of medieval warfare, and many castles and towns were captured by small groups of soldiers who scaled the walls unnoticed and opened the gate from within. I just used the term small groups to describe these teams, but it has to be mentioned that while it would only be a small portion of the overall army, these operations could still comprise of hundreds of people in some cases. So compared to today's special operations, the amount of people was still quite large. These soldiers also weren't necessarily specialized into doing these kinds of operations. They were generally a selection of regular soldiers from the army, although often the most experienced were chosen to carry out these tasks. Defenders could also launch special operations, like sorties, to attack the besieging camp by surprise and sabotage their siege engines. But I have already made a separate video on sorties, so in this video I will mainly focus on the operations where they would sneak into a fortification to capture it. One of the most well known instances of this was at Chateau Gaillard, where the besieging French forces found a weakness in the walls where a chapel window had been built into it. The soldiers, boosting each other up, snuck through there to enter the castle, which led to them capturing it. This was just a lucky find by the French, exploiting an extreme blunder on the part of King John, who had commissioned the chapel to be built, compromising an otherwise hugely defensive castle. Often, special operations would take a lot more skill and planning. I will now cover two examples of how operations like this were carried out. During the final parts of the Reconquista, the Marquis of Cadiz organized one of these operations against the town of Alhama. He had a number of scouts and spies in his service, and one day it was reported that this Moorish town was only lightly guarded and might be taken by surprise. The prominent town was situated on a rocky outcrop, partly surrounded by a river canyon. The town citadel was its main defensive stronghold. On one side was the town and on the other was the steep cliff of the canyon. Its strong position and the town's location relatively deep within the Muslim lands of Granada had resulted in its guards feeling deceptively secure and slacking in their duties. The Marquis of Cadiz sent a scout at night to confirm the spy's information. He studied the battlements and saw only a few guards on duty. The scout, clambering up the cliff towards the walls of the castle, marked a certain places where it might be possible to scale the walls using ladders. He also observed and took note of which hours there were the least guards. He returned without being discovered and the operation was ready to begin. The army arrived on the outskirts of Alhama a few hours before dawn. Here the main force remained hidden, while 300 men were sent out to take the castle by scaling its walls. An experienced climber named Ortega de Prado led the first group of 30 men with scaling ladders, who silently made their way up the cliffs, fixing their ladders in the appropriate positions. They cautiously ascended to the battlements, and made it up without being spotted. But as they made their way through the castle, they came upon a guard. 
Ortega put the knife to his neck and ordered him to point the way to the guard room. The guard did as he was ordered, but Ortega killed them straight after, as the attackers could not afford the risk of him sounding alarm. Many of the guards were killed while they were sleeping, and others were caught by surprise. Everyone they came across was killed, as the scaling party was too small to take prisoners, and sparing witnesses was also too risky. By the time the alarm spread through the castle, all 300 men had already made it in and taken control of the castle's towers. The startled garrison put up a fight, but it was already too late. Fighting from room to room, the scaling party made its way down the castle to a postern gate, which they opened to let in the main force which was still hiding on the outside. Another example I wanted to talk about was the capture of Antioch. I've talked about this siege a few times before in this series, but I've never gone into detail on how exactly the city was captured. The operation was a lot bigger than the one at Alhama. Here, about 700 men took part, and they were split into two parties. This is also an example where we'll see that operations like this didn't always go flawlessly. It started with a ruse. The Turkish forces were marching towards the city, and it would only be a matter of days before they would arrive to lift the Crusaders' siege. The Crusaders had multiple camps around the city, and one day, in full view of the defenders, a significant section under the leadership of Bohemond retreated, seemingly deserting the siege. However, with the defenders now thinking the Crusaders are starting to break up the siege, Bohemond and his forces secretly returned at night to launch the operation. This ruse was only step one of the plan. Next, the first larger party under the leadership of Bohemond would scale the walls near the Tower of the Two Sisters. Ferus was the commander of this section of the wall. He was a former Christian who had converted to Islam. But in weeks prior, he had secretly switched sides and was actually working with Bohemond. Bohemond had promised to rebaptize him to bring him back to the Christian faith. After which, great riches and honors would be bestowed upon him. In return, Firuz had to make sure that this section of the wall was unguarded, providing a safe point where the Crusaders could scale the walls undetected. Once they had taken control of this part of the wall, they would sound the horn signaling to the second, smaller party under the leadership of Godfrey of Brion to launch an attack on the citadel which was located at the top of the mountains overlooking the city. To keep the secret plan from getting out, most of the main crusader force was kept in the dark, and only a few leaders knew what was actually going to happen. They ordered the remaining troops to prepare for the approaching army. This way, when the real operation was revealed, they would be prepared for battle and ready to assist in the city's capture. On the night of the operation, the two parties made their way up the hillside. Ferruz's tower was halfway up the mountain, and the citadel was at the very top. So just to get into the right positions, these troops would have already had to undergo a difficult journey in the middle of the night, sneaking up crags and valleys, making it to the specified locations. When Bohemond's party arrived at the tower of the two sisters, they found Ferruz looking out for them from the tower. Anxiously, he informed them to wait and stay hidden as a prefect with a retinue of soldiers was patrolling the walls to inspect the defenders were not slacking in their duties. Ferus told them to wait until they saw the prefect's light pass over the walls. After a little while, they did indeed see the light of a lantern coming from one side of the wall passing through the towers and continuing on. Ferus gave them the all clear and the scaling party brought the ladder up to the foot of the wall. In order to reduce any potential noise, ropes were dropped down from the wall to quietly lift the ladder in place. 
Bohemond had previously convinced Ferruz to hand over his son to the Crusaders as a guarantee that he wouldn't double-cross them. Yet Bohemond was still suspicious of Ferruz and still considered the possibility that they were being led into a trap. But so far Ferruz had come through on his side of the bargain. An oversight on the Crusaders' part, however, was that they only brought one ladder with them. Hundreds of crusaders would have to get onto the wall, so getting everyone in with just one ladder would take a while. With every second that passed, the chances of them being discovered grew greater. One by one, and with great caution, men started ascending to the top of the walls. Still apprehensive about a potential trap, Bohemond stayed at the bottom. After some time, about 60 crusaders had made it up the wall, and they had already taken control of the section that Ferruz was in charge of. The more men came up onto the wall, the more chance there was that neighboring towers, which were not in on the plan, would notice something was wrong, and it would also only be a matter of time before the prefect would do the rounds again to inspect the perimeter. With this in mind, Ferruz grew agitated. Allegedly, in Greek, he vented about Bohemond. What kind of operation is this? Is he trying to get us all killed? Why would he only bring one ladder? He faced the crusaders already hiding within his tower and told them, We have too few francs with us. Where is that great leader Bohemond? One of the men scurried back down the ladder, holding up the operation further. He ran to Bohemond, and quietly, as to not alarm the men around them, he told him that the men inside were getting worried about his inaction. Bohemond gathered his courage, went up the ladder himself, and launched an assault on the neighboring sections of the wall. As the assault was happening, with men still coming up the ladder to reinforce them, it broke. With the only point of entrance now gone, the crusaders on the walls were cut off from the rest of the force. Without the constant influx of additional men, they would be unable to keep the momentum of the assault going. Luckily, Ferruz mentioned there was a postern gate somewhere in the adjacent section. After some searching, they were able to locate it and break open the gate, allowing the rest of the soldiers to enter. In all the excitement, one of the things was forgotten, however. Bohemond was meant to sound the horn as he launched his attack. But by the time the horn was blown, the fight had already commenced, and news of the attack had already reached the citadel. So by the time the signal to attack came to the second party, the citadel's defenders were ready for them, and unable to capture it, they were beaten back. Meanwhile, Bohemond's party was faring better, making gains and spreading across the wall. By the morning, the crusaders' main army, unaware of what had taken place, woke up with Bohemond's banner flying over the gatehouse. They soon got up and entered the city through the opened gate to take part in capturing the rest of the city. Operations like this were an integral part of medieval warfare. Many of them took place, often having a similar plan of sneaking into the castle either by surprise or by help from within with the goal of opening a gate to let the main force inside. If you want to learn more about the operations defenders might launch, I will put the video on sorties on screen right now. And if you're interested in more medieval siege tactics, you can also check out my siege tactics playlist. I'd like to thank my patrons and channel members for their support, especially my $25 patron, G. David.